400 years ago, Galileo turned a telescope to the night sky and fundamentally changed the way we think about ourselves and our place in the universe. Galileo saw the phases of Venus and determined that Venus was traveling around the sun, not the Earth. He discovered the four large moons around Jupiter. These were other bodies that were not traveling around the Earth. And he saw mountains on our moon. The heavenly bodies were not perfect. All of these observations were contrary to what people were being taught at the time. These discoveries altered our perception of our location in the universe. No longer were we in some special place. Instead, we were part of a grander, more complicated, and at times, admittedly, a, an intimidating universe. I think that the best of science that people do has this effect. It, it alters our perception and allows us to access things that we haven't seen before. Take, for example, the electromagnetic spectrum. We see invisible light. We don't see in radio waves, we don't see in infrared, we don't see in gamma rays or x-rays. But those specter out there and we can find them. Similarly, right now, passing through your body, you have trillions of neutrinos, subatomic particles, moving through you every second. They come from our sun and from our galaxy and from beyond that. So we need special insight. We need special detectors and particularly tenacious people to chase down these dark sectors in the universe. I'm a physicist and I'm, I'm part of a search for gravitational waves. So my interests are in things like fundamental forces like gravity and fundamental particles and elements of what I'm calling this dark sector. Things like black holes. Objects whose gravity is so strong uh, that they draw an event horizon around themselves from which not even light can escape. Or dark matter and dark energy, they're, they're significant constituents of the universe, but we really don't know what they are. This is some indirect evidence for dark matter that comes from the bullet cluster. And gravitational waves. Predicted by Einstein, finding gravitational waves is is akin to acquiring a new sense that allows us to listen to the universe instead of just uh, look at it. In the early 1900s, Einstein sought to remake gravity theory and correct some of the problems that he understood in Newton's theory. He made simple thought experiments, uh, like what if I was in an elevator in deep space and there was a rope attached to that elevator and someone pulled on it and accelerated it? Wouldn't that feel like gravity to me in that elevator? And are gravity and acceleration then the same thing? Einstein toiled bravely on for a decade, finally formulating this mathematical opus, the general theory of relativity. Relativity makes these weird predictions, things like the bending of starlight, or the existence of black holes and the Big Bang, or gravitational waves. General relativity solves some of the problems of of Newton's gravity, which was how does the force of gravity propagate from one place to another in the universe? No one knew. The relativity's answer was gravitational waves. These are distortions in the metric of space that we live in, vibrations in the medium of space that we live in, and things in it go along for the ride. So if I can make an analogy, consider a painting. The medium that that paint lives in is the canvas. If I herk on that canvas, stretch it, then the paint goes along for the ride and gets distorted. In this video, you can see there are 10 rings in space, identical circular rings, and a gravitational wave is passing down the axis of these rings. The medium of space is getting expanded on one axis and contracted on the other, and then vice versa, contracted and expanded. That's the signature for a gravitational wave. So those identical rings squeezing and expanding of space. You don't need a ring detector to actually detect them. You can see the modification of space-time by just making an L-shaped detector and looking at the relative length change. Gravitational waves are incredibly weak. The sources, things like neutron stars and black holes for loud gravitational waves, are distant. Uh, space, as a medium, is, is a stiff medium. It's not like jello. It's more like steel. And gravitational waves stream freely through matter. So if we want to peer into the core of a supernova and learn about it, then we can't do that with light because all the light scatters against matter on the way out. 
But gravitational waves stream freely out of that system. The only way you can look at it is through gravitational waves. In the 1960s, several people around the world came up with the idea, why not use a laser interferometer to actually look for gravitational waves? In this video, you'll see light being sent onto a beam splitter, and the light propagates down. And if the arm lengths change, you read that out at something called an output port. Light is an electromagnetic wave that's incident on a beam splitter. Half the light goes down one arm, half the light goes down the other. And those wave fronts march down and then reflect off end mirrors and come back to the beam splitter. At the output port, then, is the sum of the light from the two arms. If the arms wave around due to anything, like the passage of a gravitational wave or maybe a truck, you get a wavering light pattern at the output port. And that's the signature for a gravitational wave. LIGO is a search for gravitational waves. It stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And it's about a 1,000 scientists and engineers worldwide who all work on this project. We have two L-shaped interferometers, one in Louisiana, which you see on the bottom here, and one in Washington State, where I'm located. They have L-shapes. That's defined by vacuum tubes that go down four kilometers each way in length. Inside hangs these uh, delicate instruments that sense the distortions that come from gravitational waves. We work with another project, Virgo, another collaboration. That's about 250 scientists and engineers, and they have a three-kilometer detector near Pisa in Italy. The sensitivity of LIGO is really quite remarkable. If our arm lengths change by one ten thousandth the size of a proton, we can detect it. That's 10 to the minus 19 meters. If we were trying to measure the distance between here and the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, it'd be like watching it change by the width of a human hair. Advanced LIGO is a second generation version of these detectors. We completed the installation and brought them online in 2015. And we ran our first search for gravitational waves with the new instruments at both Louisiana and Washington in September 2015 to January 2016. In the early morning hours of September 14th, a signal from space passed through the Earth. This signal came from two black holes. And you can see this in the simulation, which uses LIGO data. Two black holes had revolved around each other and merged together to form a larger black hole and sent out a pulse of gravitational waves into the universe. This system merged 1.3 billion years ago. And those waves have been propagating to the Earth and all through the universe since. On September 14th, they passed through the Earth, first in the Louisiana detector, and then secondly, seven milliseconds later, in the Washington detector. And our Louisiana colleagues love to point out they saw gravitational waves first. <laughs> this first signal is so loud and so clear, it's actually two objects, 30 times the mass of our sun, revolving around each other at over half the speed of light. When they merged, they converted three times the mass of our sun into gravitational waves. For a brief moment, this system outshone all the stars in the known universe, summed up together. And none of it came out in light. It all came out in deformations in the shape of space. It's astonishing. We can listen to these gravitational waves. We're going to play you some audio. You're going to hear first our detector noise, and then you'll hear a chirp. And this is the point at which these two black holes revolve together and merge. You'll hear two variants of it. One, uh, which is at the true frequency of the detector, that's kind of low. And then you'll hear uh, uh, we've boosted in frequency. And that makes it easier to hear. So let's have a listen. This is the first time in history that people have heard the sounds of space-time. On December 23rd, I was in our control room in Washington, and I was talking to some of my colleagues, and we were worried. We had had this first event three months ago, and we were wondering, where are, where's our second event? Where's our other events? Why aren't there weaker events? What's going on? We were concerned. Two days later, on Christmas night, I was in a gas station in Victoria, BC, and I got a call from a colleague of mine, Vern Sandberg. He said, we have another candidate. 
So about 20 of us jumped on a conference call and spent a couple of hours vetting this candidate, as we do for, for interesting triggers. And within a few hours, it became clear. This was a second gravitational wave event. This was it. It's another binary black hole merger, just announced last week. This is second event was such a relief to me. It meant that the field of gravitational wave astronomy was truly launched. It was, it was truly underway, and, and we had witnessed it. You can hear the difference in these second black holes, the second merger of black holes. They're actually lighter, and so they spend less time in our detector, and they chirp up to higher frequencies. So let's listen to that one. So what have we learned from these two binary black hole mergers? A century after Einstein predicted them, gravitational waves have been directly detected. In the process, a new class of black holes have been detected, heavy stellar mass black holes, heavier than are known through X-ray observations. Binary black holes exist, and binary black holes merge. All of these observations are examples of, of expanding our horizons and probing these dark sectors in our universe. Furthermore, Einstein was right about his general theory of relativity. If we compare our gravitational wave waveforms to those predicted by general relativity, we can't find any need for any other mathematical theory uh, to explain them. Think of that. Knowing nothing about black holes or relativistic astrophysics, Einstein's thought experiments yielded this mathematical machinery that completely explains and predicts this first test of strong dynamical gravity. It's hard to overstate how remarkable that is. So where is our field going and where are these related fields going? We have these two binary black hole mergers in our data. We also have a weaker event. Uh, we think it's probably a binary black hole, but it's a little too faint and too distant to say for certain. We're going to continue to uh, improve the sensitivity of our detectors over the coming years. If we reach our design sensitivity in two years, we could see a binary black hole merger every day. We'll see other types of events. We'll see neutron stars merging together, too. These are corpses of dead stars, things that weigh a billion tons per teaspoon that will merge together and form a black hole. And we'll learn lots about the nuclear physics of extreme materials when we do that. We'll also see things like explosions of stars and supernova or spinning pulsars. And all of this gravitational wave astronomy and, and drama will be caught not just by gravitational wave interferometers, but we'll also train ordinary telescopes, visible light telescopes, radio telescopes, gamma ray telescopes, onto those systems and learn other aspects of astrophysics from them in a burgeoning era of multi-messenger astronomy. We might get a complete surprise. That would be marvelous, it would be wonderful. To get a surprise, something that we hadn't expected, hadn't been theoretically predicted, that's possible. About 5% of the universe is counted for in things we understand and know, things like planets and stars and galaxies and dust and light and subatomic particles. Fully 95% exists in things we really don't understand at all, dark matter and dark energy. Not knowing what 95% of the mass energy of the universe is a pretty astonishing level of ignorance. <laughs> but it's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity for scientists, for students, for young people to forge a new era, a new age of astronomy and cosmology of the dark sector. People will make ground-based experiments, space-based experiments, and in the coming years, learn more progressively better things about gravitational waves and dark matter and dark energy, and significantly begin to understand these dark sectors of the universe. Galileo turned his simple visible light telescope to the night sky, and it radically changed the way we understand ourselves and our place in the universe. Since then, we've made more sensitive and better telescopes. This is the start of gravitational wave astronomy. It's here now. And we have first detection and now our second detection announced last week. Gravitational wave astronomy is here. And from now on, we'll go ahead and make better 
gravitational wave detectors and not only learn about the universe by looking at it, but also by listening to it.